Okay, so, um, hi, thanks for coming. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, setting up Spryker with Docker and deploying it with Kubernetes. Um, so the agenda is talking about the local Docker setup, like we do it, um, then, or in comparison also to the Spryker setup. And sorry, I forgot something. Um, then next will be the deployment in Kubernetes. Um, and later on, I will give some insights, share some tips and tricks, and some failures we had uh, while developing all of this. Um, yeah. So, me, my name is uh, Bernd Alter. I'm here, uh, technical director at Turbine. If you want to find me on Twitter or GitHub, it's bazoo08515. And um, yeah, I, I called it Spryker early adopter. We've been working with Spryker basically from the very beginning. Um, we implemented or we launched the, the very first project with Spryker, which was a marketplace for Switzerland. Um, this was even before there was like the first official version of, of Spryker, so we uh, have quite some experience with it. I've been working personally in seven projects with Spryker, so quite a lot. Um, and I just want to give this fair warning, so this is all very opinionated. opinionated. So we, it, this is how we do it. You might not agree, um, but it might be useful or helpful to share this experience. Um, you might have some takeaways from it. We'll see. Um, so, who's using Docker, a uh, Spryker with Docker yet? So, not all. So, who's using the VM? Should be the other ones? Okay. <laughs> Come on, really? <laughs> okay. So, the Spryker guys don't use the Spryker Docker setup well. Mm. Hmm? Oh, use both. Okay, okay. <laughs> then you're fine. Okay, good. Um, so, and yes. All of you who are, who are using Spryker with Docker use the Spryker Docker setup, right? Or is someone, uh, okay, well, so is someone using his own Docker setup? Okay, cool, oh, quite a lot. Nice, so we may exchange later on about our different approaches. So, um, yeah, so you mind, uh, it's the same, same, but different. Uh, after all, it's a Docker setup, so there's, um, in general, it's the same. Um, so, like Spryker, we create also our own base images. Um, we, they are project independent, so we create one base image, uh, PHP base image. We create several Nginx um, base images that we use then all of the projects. Um, and this is, of course, all this, the, the required stuff you usually need for Spryker is then included, like the modules, like the tooling, etc. Um, but we split the containers. That's, uh, first of all, the, the difference. So Spryker does it just all in one container. There's everything, like um, PHP, uh, the, the application code. There's Nginx included. And basically, you have, no? I, I just checked out the Spryker Docker suite uh, today, or yesterday, and it's like this. So it's all included in one. OK, well, so then you do it differently now. So I, I, f I found this example where it's all in one container. So, But anyway, so we split this all up. So we have one PHP container, one Nginx container per layer, like Z, E, glue. Um, and um, so we also don't have any shared file space. So we copy everything, for example, in the Nginx containers. Um, so the public stuff, the static content. And um, why, of course, it's, it's, um, it's a faster, cleaner setup, and it reduces also the dependencies, so you can scale out whatever you want, like um, all the pods and uh, the Nginx, the PHP, Z, Glue, Eve, um, just uh, the way you need it. And there's also, because I found this example with the supervisor D process that is then orchestrating both the PHP um, process and the Nginx process, and this you can get rid of by, by just simply splitting it up and using Docker in the I think the, the way it's supposed to be, like having one process and not running multiple processes. I mean, we had the project where this was a requirement actions actually from the client side that we should combine both in the same container. I objected and they discussed this with the client often, but um, they insisted and so we did it and this caused a lot of, yeah, yeah I would say troubles um, to, to get this running and to have this running smoothly and, and really stable. 
Um, what we also do, and I didn't find this in the example also, uh, that we use environmental variables for the PHP config. So I saw in the example that uh, you're still using templates um, and, and parse the templates and inject actually the values for the, for the placeholders. But um, you can also use in the PHP config, you can just use environmental variables. So you don't have to change the ini files, you just pass in the ini files with the, with the um, environmental variables that you want to use. As you can see here, there's, I mean, this is for some reason this is static, um, but the other uh, options are all environmental variables. And then you can pass in the different values depending on the environment that you set up. This is much more convenient, it's faster, you don't have to do any uh, processing, as I put it, so it's all built in, and you don't need any config templates, it's, it's much cleaner uh, uh, regarding the, the um, config files, and you c uh, don't have this additional processing when you deploy it or, or build it. Um, for local environment, um, to, and, and we did some, uh, some iterations on this topic uh, to increase the performance locally, um, especially for the Mac users, because as you know, Docker and Mac does not really go well together, so there are some issues and you need to have some workarounds for this. Um, so first of all, a general um, recommendation is to use delegated as an option. So this is then, um, inside, so the, the, in terms of synchronization, the, the container is taking precedence and uh, it's not um, synced in like real time or is, is not um, so sync um, sorry host and um, container are not always in complete sync so the host gets um, maybe the, the updates a little bit later so it's synced back to the host a little bit um, slower maybe uh, but this increases in general the performance of the container so this is better for volume mounts if you mount in some stuff uh, from the host um, for the Mac hosts um, we do what also uh, Spryker does for the local environment. We use the unresolvable cache, uh, where, it, where it actually um, keeps track and builds a cache um, of all the classes that cannot be found, because in Spryker you have these various um, fallbacks, like with the store concept and the project level and the, the core level and so on. And if you, and then Spryker is always checking for classes and if there's maybe uh, this is overwritten on, on any level. And usually most of the code is not overwritten on store level, but it will always check. So it will check like, uh, is there a checkout DE or, um, um, modification? Is there a class? And usually there's not, so it's all, you always have this file I.O., which is on a Mac, is, is a pain. And um, Spryker, in, in the, with this unresolvable cache, it does something similar like the, the dump um, um, of the class dump of Composer, but like basically in reverse. So it, it keeps track of all the uh, classes that are not there. So it has this one cache that it reads as an array and it checks, okay, um, the file is not there. I've checked this before, so I don't have to look on the, um, on the disk. So this saves you some file I.O. Um, the disadvantage is that this cache builds up and if you later on add these classes and you don't uh, delete the cache, then uh, it won't find this file. So you might end up with uh, some weird errors and uh, have maybe have a hard time to figure this out if you don't keep in mind that you have this cache activated. And so we added this um, file watcher with FS Watch on Mac and this is just keeping track of, of new files. And if there's a new file, it just cleans the cache and then uh, this is uh, built up again. And this way we could um, speed up the Mac, uh, the Mac hosts uh, to be almost as fast as the Linux machines. This was quite a good improvement. So um, this was about the local Docker setup. If you have questions, jump in and edit at any time. Yes? Uh, can you go back to the PHP ini setup? Um, this? No, so you have to restart. If you change the environmental variables that are passed into the container, you have to restart the Docker container. Also with a, yeah, 
you have to restart the Docker container, either locally or on the uh, Kubernetes environment. You cannot change this on the fly. So, so um, for Kubernetes, just in general about the setup, we have uh, several Kubernetes clusters. We we run ourselves, so we don't use um, AWS or, or Google Cloud plat Platform for this. Um, we we set up uh, these clusters with Hetzner service, so um, bare metal service. This worked for us better than, than any virtual machines like uh, AWS or anything. Um, we have a semi-automated setup with kubeadm for this, so we can spin up a cluster in, what do you say, like two hours? Like this, well, six node cluster, six, uh, two hours. Um, hmm? Yeah, uh, so, and uh, for, for large projects, we have our own dedicated cluster, so each large, larger project, or especially when, when there are um, also external developers are involved, then we use, um, we use a dedicated cluster with four to six nodes, maybe more, depending on the project size. Um, because in, in Kubernetes, um, it's, it's not impossible, but it's, it's harder, it's, it's quite some effort to set this up to, uh, so that you have different users which have different access to different namespaces and so on, and you wanna um, save this effort to, to um, segregate or separate the users from each other on one Kubernetes cluster. So this, then it's easier to just have one Kubernetes cluster and then give people access to this. Uh, but for some smaller projects, um, we use one shared cluster. It's just internal stuff and there can be, I don't know, like six, seven, eight projects on one uh, four node cluster or six node clusters. Um, for the Kubernetes clusters, I mean, we. Uh, developed all of this, uh, we started uh, setting up uh, Spryker with Docker um, four years ago, I would say, something like this. Um, so way before uh, um, Spryker did this uh, themselves. And uh, so we, we ran into several problems. We, we had, as I said, several iterations of this. Um, and uh, so one of the problems was on the Kubernetes clusters that uh, we noticed that the actually building the images, the Docker images on the cluster was a huge bottleneck because uh, sometimes we had projects with, I don't know, 10, 15 people working on this, pushing, and we uh, create a pipeline, and we do image builds on every push. So, and then um, the, the Docker builder became a bottleneck because it was just one process, and it could, I think, handle like four builds at a time, um, and just this basically sequentially. And um, so, if you imagine like 15 people pushing, can be a lot of, of builds, lots of images, because you have, as I said, you have the, the different PHP images, the Nginx images, some other images that we use that um, needed to be rebuilt every time. We also optimized this, so it doesn't, didn't have to be rebuilt every time. But in the beginning, it was like that. And uh, so, we built our own image builder. We created this uh, in Go and created basically a proxy um, that because um, in a Kubernetes cluster, by default, you cannot have more than one Docker process, Docker build uh, uh, that, that is uh, responsible for, for building images. But we build an image builder proxy uh, for this, so we could have multiple processes, Docker build process in the background, and it was just this proxy then distributing the builds to these uh, separate, uh, several um, Docker um, processes. So this was then solving this issue, so we could build basically as many images as we want, um, and so this went away. Um, another problem was that we had, <laughs> in the beginning, quite a high load when so many people were, were working on this, so we built uh, test environments for running the front-end tests, so there's one dedicated environment per pipeline, per branch, um, or per push, uh, actually not uh, per commit. Um, to build one test environment to run the acceptance tests, the front end tests. So the full environment was set up, was uh, spun up um, in the Kubernetes cluster, a new namespace with all the services, all the containers, all the pods. And um, then also later on the review environments, because you want to have a review environment for every branch. And uh, this, the, the, all the namespaces piled up. We, we had um, situations where we had like 60 or 80 namespaces running in the Kubernetes cluster, and this was eating up all the resources. So, um, yeah, 
people could not work anymore. And so for this, we, we uh, created some basic garbage collection cron job that was uh, cleaning up this because test environments, we could just clean after half an hour or an hour because uh, the, the tests should not run that long. And for the review environments, we clean this up, I think, after two days because then we assume that it's not needed anymore. So this uh, also saved a lot of resources and, and um, took down the load on the Kubernetes clusters a lot. Um, so is anyone using GitLab, GitLab CI? Also, okay. <laughs> so the others are using for, for CI, probably like Travis CI, something like this, or Circle CI, I guess. Yeah, okay. So we have our, our own GitLab server running. I can really recommend this. It's very smooth, very easy to maintain. Um, and you get the, the of course, the, the, whole, uh, the Git stuff plus the CI pipeline. And this is um, what, uh, this is actually the, the GitLab pipeline we have set up for the Docker deploy, for the Kubernetes deployment of the B2B suite, the Spryker B2B suite. So here's some stuff missing. This is just basic um, stuff in the beginning where you run some, some tests and you do s the PHP build, the code build, and so on. And so then we build all the images in one step. Then here, as I said, we deploy the test environment. We run the, the front-end tests. We also run uh, performance tests with Locust. And then later on in the, in the end, we deploy the review environment. Um, so we have, um, for the image builds for the code, we actually just have one, or we, we switch back to having just one image build uh, for the application with a Spryker code. Uh, this used to be different steps, like different builds, one for the Eve, one for Z, or yeah, at that time there was no glue, so we just had Eve and Z builds. But uh, then we figured out, okay, well, it doesn't matter, so it's just some, some code you push around and either you use it or not, and so we saved some time by just having one application image for this. And as I said, we then deploy the review environments and one environment per branch, so you can check in the Kubernetes cluster, like the PO or the developer themselves can check on the review environment the, the feature they just implemented in that branch. Um, we have uh, lots of uh, tooling and, and automated testing integrated, like syntax, PHP stan, uh, PHP MD, the code sniffer, a little bit extended, uh, the, the uh, rule set that Spryker provides, and then, of course, the full set of tests. And um, for the master environment, um, we, we have a quite static environment, so we only deploy the new code uh, on that pipeline, and we keep all the stateful services, so this way we can figure out, for example, problems with data migrations or with schema migrations, because the uh, quite common problem is that someone is adding a column to a table, and this is uh, not null, and then you deploy it, and there, then there are uh, existing records, and and uh, the database does not know what to do to, with this, and uh, it fails. And this way you can figure this out quite easily if you have these stateful services on one specific environment. Can be the master environment, can also be if you're using uh, also develop branch, and can also be the develop <coughs> branch. And I really recommend to do this, to do it like this. Um, what we also created there um, is uh, generating code coverage reports. and. Um, the, the tricky part is, I don't know if anyone of you has ever uh, tried or managed to, to get the code coverage for front-end tests in Spryker, um, because it, it's kind of built in, but uh, it, it, from the very beginning it didn't work, and um, it took me quite a while to get this up and running, but finally I managed uh, to do this, and then after I managed to get the code coverage reports, I noticed, okay, well, then I have now two reports, and I gotta get them merged because I want to have finally one report that uh, that shows me the coverage. And uh, so for this, I use then PHP Conf and Robo, so you can use the XML files and and merge them. There's some nice tooling, but this would be uh, too too much to to explain this right now. Um, might be a different talk. Um, yeah, about the CI pipeline, I just wanted to show some, some quick examples of uh, what... So this is the, the one that I just showed you. So here's the, the stuff in the beginning, so just some linting, code sniffer, and so on. So this is very straightforward. And then... So this is a real-world example 
of a branch pipeline for, um, for a project. And here you have um, also the, it's, it looks a little bit different, it's, a, it's an older one, so that's why the, the steps are a little bit different, but basically it does the same, so it's also building the images here, it's, it does the testing, does the deploy for the, for, the review, uh, for the testing environment and later on the review environment. And then for the, for the master, this looks different because here we uh, skip a lot of the basic testing like lintex, uh, 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 li uh, syntax linting. Doesn't make any sense to do this over and over again. Uh, so we assume that no one broke this on the merge to master, um, which is a fair assumption, I guess. And uh, then we do just the basic stuff we need. Also do, again, the, the front end testing. And then later on, here's uh, some, some stuff. So there's a deployment to a dev environment, which is on customer side, and their target environment. And then here's all the, the code coverage done. So and because, as I said, you have to merge the stuff. This is then separated into, into several, uh, several steps. So this can be quite a large pipeline then in the end. Um, so now the, the actual deployment, once we're done with the full CI environment, then, um, and as I said, this is very opinionated, so you might not agree that this is a good way to do this, but it worked for us very well, because also, uh, because we are an agency, um, and we deal with many projects, with many customers, and uh, it's not just one project, one, one application that we're working on. So we sometimes have to separate certain, uh, certain things um, so, not, so that the customer does not have access. Because usually our, our customers, our clients, have access to the project repo, of course, because it's basically their code. But um, they should not, probably not see all, what's, what's um, running in the background, or we don't want to share all of, all of our knowledge that we built over the last five years in this, in this area. So this is why we separate this a little bit. Um, so what we do is we have the project repo. And um, usually we do this on, on tagging that we trigger an update to a separate repo. Um, I will show you later on some code examples. Um, so the, we call this deploy to hosting. Maybe there's a better name. Um, and this repo just contains all the Kubernetes stuff. So the, the manifests for Kubernetes to deploy the services and um, the, the basic configuration or the basic services, the, the YAML files for Kubernetes are located in the project repo. And then they are kind of merged. And um, um, so the, the services, the YAMLs are merged. And then they are merged into this uh, deploy to hosting repo. And there you have, an, in the repo, you have a generated folder where all of this ends up, the auto-generated stuff. And you can, but you can also customize this. So there's a possibility to override certain things like the resources you want to have for the services or add some more services or whatever. Um, and there's a, a separate repo called config, which holds, surprise, the config for this environment um, where we basically put on all the environmental variables for the different services. And then this both together, so the, the deployment to the environment is then done basically automatically, and the config deployment is done uh, usually manually, so you, we have some make files and some command, uh, the command line tools to uh, apply the configuration to the service, or to the, to the environments. And uh, this is just the one step, so in total, it might look like this. So this is, these are all the same steps, and we we have this. Um, uh, so we have the steps like uh, building on top of each other. So first, we deploy to a dev environment. Um, we have separate uh, repos for this. So we have one deploy to hosting for the dev environment, one for staging, one for production. There might be others. We have a project where there are, I think, five different environments, and so this. Uh, so to, to deploy to the next environment right now, uh, we will most likely do this a little bit smoother and, and more automated in the future. So we merge from one deploy to hosting to another deploy to hosting in, um, repo. So from one environment to the other. And this uh, might just be a simple merge. Uh, 
but might also be that, that we want to add something in a different environment than later on. And uh, for the config, it's, uh, it's the same. So we have uh, separate repos for the different environments. And so this way, in, in this project, you can only deploy to production if you like first deploy to de uh, development, then to staging, and then later on it ends up on production after all QA or whatever is done, and everything is working. Um, so this is just summarizing what I just said. So um, the, the configuration changes are, are maintained manually. So we, whenever, for example, there's a new environmental variable, we have to add it manually to all the repositories. Also not so convenient right now, so you have to keep this in mind and have to do this uh, um, in, in multiple steps. But that's the way it, it is right now, because we just started this way of separating the, the different repos and the different processes just one year ago. And we're still working on this and optimizing this, evaluating this. So there are new itera uh, um, more iterations to come, I guess. And um, so I can show you some examples what this looks like. So can you see this? Kind of. <laughs> so it's not necessary that you read all of this just to, to get a, a big picture. So here we have, uh, this is in the, in the project repo. So we have here a Kubernetes folder with uh, the manifests. And this is basically Kubernetes YAML files for, um, for um, setting up and configuring the different services, the different pods. So this is, the, for example, the, the Z pod, uh, sorry, the glue pod the configuration with all the stuff, like the container things, the resources, and readiness probes, whatever you need. And uh, yeah, the, the two services, Nginx and PHP, um, as you can see here, using the images and having uh, yeah, some, some secrets that are, or some authentication that is included, and later on the service configuration, very simple, very basic Kubernetes stuff. Same here for Z, it's no no big magic, some, some uh, commands may be included to do some stuff in the beginning on, on starting the containers. And this is for all the services. And this goes then into this here. So here we have the config repo and we have the deployment repo. And for the deployment, as you can see here, you have this generated folder. This is, uh, yeah, as the name says, generated. So. Uh, you're not supposed to change this, but here you can, in the overlays, in the patches, you can actually then um, change some stuff and override and extend it. And so this is the application. This is the one, as you can see here, uh, manifest generated. So this is the auto-generated stuff with all the services in one file, like what I showed before, Glue, Z, uh, Elasticsearch, all of this. And um, then here we have in this... In this uh, overlays folder, we have memories, um, CPU re resources. There we can overwrite all the resources that are configured for the, for the different services. So we can give on staging or on production, uh, give it uh, more uh, memory, more CPU. We can also change um, some, uh, some other stuff like uh, n number of pods we want to start and so on, or the... the um, What's it called? The, the uh, policy. Help me, help me, Timo. Sorry. So the, the, po the policy for scaling. Uh, the that's that's it. <laughs> See. Uh, yeah, this this kind of stuff. So this is all then here, and then for the configuration. So this was the deploy repository, and this is an actual example of a project. I just kind of anonymized this a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of this and not sharing all the secrets, especially when it's recorded. So yeah, yeah. Mm. This took me half an hour. <laughs> um, so as you can see here, we have all the the uh, configuration here, the environmental variables, and uh, so we use config maps uh, to for the different services. So we don't have to apply all the environmental uh, environmental variables to all the different uh, containers, so we split this up a little bit. And yeah, as you can see, we make quite extended use of extensive use of environmental variables. This is then a little bit simpler for the queues and the crons and so on. But for the general spiker configuration, is quite a lot. Um, but it's, it's really nice to have this then per environment and based on this environmental variables. And as you can see here in this project, we have uh, three different 
um, things, and this is the same here for, so here we also have ERP API, uh, the front end, and uh, why isn't there not another one? Did I miss it? There should be one, that, or is it just one? Yeah. This one, ah, okay, okay. So, oops, sorry. Ah, I knew that it was, this would happen. Come back, yeah. Um, so because the in this case, the application consists of, of three different components, so three different repos. Um, one is yeah, ERP APA, one is front end, because we, we implemented a uh, view SPA for this, and um, then Spryker as the backend. And so uh, this go in, in from all the the project from all the repos the project repos, this is merged into one co um, deployed to hosting uh, repository. So the deployment is is then in one repository and not separated or split up in in multiple ones, but uh, one and also the the configuration. So you have this all in one place for one specific environment. Um, is there anything else? No. Okay, this is just about the, the base images, uh, the repo uh, that we built. So as you can see here with the PHP configuration, the Xdebug configuration, the Relic configuration, and so on that we did. So we have environmental variables for all of this. And then uh, with, so this is going a little bit back. So and then you have the default settings with production-ready settings um, as defaults in the Docker file. So you can basically not mess this up when you just deploy to production and you forget to set an environmental variable, hopefully. Um, yeah, going back to the presentation. Um, what, uh, the, these are the, the different, yeah, I call it flavors of Kubernetes, uh, where we deploy to, so OpenShift, Metacube, uh, this is a service set up by Sys11, uh, OpenStack and AWS. Um, because some, some customers wanted to have this on AWS, but not with Kubernetes, just plain Docker deployment there, and then scale it with um, AWS instances. Um, does any one of you know or use OpenShift? Okay. Know or use? No. <laughs> okay. Um, because OpenShift is a little bit special. If you ever have to deal with this, you got to be aware that there's some uh, more work involved because it ri requires containers with non-root user. So you cannot uh, run the processes as it is usually done by default in, in uh, Docker with root uh, privileges. And uh, so you have to, to uh, set up the container in a different way, also have to assign certain permissions to the, uh, um, to the files and folders. And also I had quite a hard time setting up the, the services um, like New Relic and Blackfire and these, these to enable these modules then on deployment to this OpenShift um, environment because the ini files, you have to be root to manage them. Um, and I didn't want to give all users access to the config files because then it basically doesn't make any sense to run as non-root if you then still have uh, access to all the configs. Um, but th actually there was no way, no other way than, than to provide uh, write and read permission or write permissions to the config files for these specific um, for these specific uh, modules and, and services. So I had to change the, the permissions for the new relic ini file to be able to modify this on, uh, on deployment because uh, you can set the config or uh, the options for the modules with environmental variables, but you cannot enable these services with environmental variables. And for example, um, like Xdebug, if you you might, uh, because I can show you this in the, in the code example, what I mean, so, oh, where is it? here we have it. So um, you could deploy this just like this, so with the, the module not enabled, but or you could disable it because there is an enable flag uh, for or option for Xdebug, but still if you load the extension, it still slows down your application. And uh, so you don't want to have this in any non-development environment. And um, so I had to do, for, for enabling this, I basically do a rewrite 
on the first line to enable this uh, module then, because there was no way, I, I tried several ways to how to do this, maybe with environmental variables, to use maybe the module name with an environmental variable, but this didn't work, because uh, if you need to have one, you cannot leave this empty, and if you provide, I, I tried it with like def null, and, but this completely messed up all this stuff, and yeah, so uh, this was uh, kind of a hack to, to get this um, to be configurable, but yeah. So this, you have to keep in mind that this requires really some work to have these base images as non-root users. Um, and then finally, some tips and tricks. I guess I exceeded my time a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so uh, what we use, uh, what we do is um, we provide make files for the local stuff, uh, so you don't have to keep in mind all the Docker commands and then all the spriker commands and so on. So we have wrappers, wrapper commands with make. So we can uh, run, uh, for example, make composer install, make code base update, which uh, then bundles a couple of um, several, uh, a couple of commands that are used for setting up the code base. We have uh, some stuff for for restarting or rebuilding all the Docker containers and so on. So this is quite nice. So you don't only have to use uh, the or have to keep in mind the make commands, and also for the Docker uh, for the Kubernetes deployment, in some places. Um, <laughs> what we tried, but we never got this running in a very stable way, is Docker Sync. Um, and I, I recommend not to use it, because there are other ways to, to get this um, in a, in a, uh, to, to increase the performance, because basically Docker Sync is then used for increasing the performance, and there are better ways. Um, just a hint, um, the PHP stand baseline feature is really nice for, for um, having, uh, for, for ignoring old Issues, just just a, a side note, and for code coverage, use peach, uh, use peachcuff. Um, <coughs> sorry, because this is really faster than a lot faster than Xdebug, uh, because it eliminates all the debugging stuff that, that Xdebug is then including when running code coverage, and it just does the coverage, and it's like five to ten times faster. Um, so. Some questions. No time for questions. No time for questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. What? Okay. <laughs> no, are, are there any questions? So, then you had a question. Yes, there's a module for codeception. It's called a C3, like codeception code coverage, I think. And this is, it is kind of built in, and it's already uh, installed on Spryker by default. But I guess no one ever tried to get this running. They just maybe installed it. And I really, I spent like in total maybe a week or two weeks to get this really running because it's very, very tricky. And you have basically a hook, um, um, like a receiver. Um, class on the application side, and then you send uh, in the beginning you send like a starting signal a trigger, uh, so it knows that it should um, should do the or should should uh, do the reporting of the code coverage and, and gather the data, and then in the end uh, you get you you uh, actually pull this um, this XML or whatever you want um, you, you pull this and download it. And this is, is is really quite tricky. And the the uh, disadvantage is, or the yeah, so you got to be aware that this only does the coverage of Eve, if you do this on Eve, uh, because uh, it cannot because then the call to Z is another call, and there you have this break. I mean, it might be possible to do al also this, but um, yeah, I I didn't try to do this yet. This might uh, involve maybe two, three, four more weeks of work. <laughs> I don't know. But this is quite tricky. More questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
um, the, the data? We don't, we don't run the, you mean like for testing or, yeah, or in general? Testing. So we don't run the testing on the staging environment. We run this in the CI pipeline. And on the staging pipeline, uh, on the staging environment, we don't do this yet. Or m most of the time, the customer or the clients are testing them they're, they're manually. But we have the automated testing set up in the CI pipeline. So staging is then the, the client's target environment or on the target platform. These are in the CI, in the CI part. So the CI pipeline, the, the, the Kubernetes cluster. And so we have our own Kubernetes cluster for, for this whole CI stuff. And then some other target uh, platform might be Kubernetes, might be OpenShift, might be something else on the client side. But we don't run the, the, um, the testing there yet. We're okay. planning to do this, but yeah. Dep depends on the projects. Um, sometimes the, the clients sync back production data to the staging environment. Sometimes we have a, a separate uh, data set we, we import there, and it, it depends on the project. It's very different. Yeah. So we just keep, it's basically we keep the, the, um, the database, we keep Elasticsearch, Redis, and so on, and don't throw it away and build it always from scratch in the, in the, for the branches, for the branch review environments. We always create the review environment from scratch. So every time we do this again. Yeah, yeah, like for the main branches. We keep this and, and don't throw it away. And so we, we um, run the migrations on an existing database with, with um, pre-existing data. Right. So we build up on top. So there's more data coming in. Maybe people are testing. So there's some data added by manual testing on the review environment. Um, but we just keep it. Don't clean this up every time. In the CI clusters, not. So they would just build it then again from scratch. Yeah. Right. More questions? No. Um, it also depends on the project. Usually we achieve with a, like the full uh, thing without coverage. Coverage takes quite some time. Uh, but without coverage, the full build, including acceptance tests, is usually like. 20 minutes, 25 minutes, so. And that's why we, uh, for, for most of the, or for some of the projects, we skip acceptance tests on the branch pipelines. So we just do it on, on master, then that might be sufficient. Okay. If you run multiple acceptance tests at the same time, you do them all sequentially. All sequentially, yeah. And we also thought about parallelizing them, but uh, we didn't do this yet. And the question then is how to split this up uh, in, a, in a way that you don't have to do this all manually all the time and have to figure out, okay, which, uh, wh what, are the, what are reasonable chunks and so on. But yes, I, I agree, we should. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well maybe we have to talk later on then. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay.